Welcome everyone. We will start with our webinar series of laparoscopic colorectal surgery and I will show you what we will have today. It's Thursday the 2nd and this is our faculty. There are some people who will join us every time. Uh, this will be Andreas Chamier and Colin Sitges and me. We put together this webinar series with Medtronic and thanks a lot for the organization. And every time we will have some guest experts with us. And this time it will be from Saudi Arabia University in Riyadh, Omar Abdullah al Obaid. So as you can see, this is a series running over 11 modules. And we started already two weeks ago with the basic of laparoscopic colorectal surgery. Last week we have the left colon. Today we are dealing with the right colon and then in September, we will proceed with special situations, principles of ICG, complications, postoperative complications and its management. We will have some special cases on D3, nodal removal and T4 tumors. We also are dealing then about the rectum surgery, transanal and TME. This is what we will present you. And of course, if you join the webinar, you can spread it to your friends and in your uh, communities and you can also later look up the modules separately if you missed one of those modules. And now we will we will start and it's it's an honor and pleasure to introduce Andrea Chamier. He's the chief in Austria in the Kepler University Clinic in Linz and he's really very experienced in laparoscopic colorectal but laparoscopic surgery at all and he will give tips and tricks first for the patient selection and the indication and talk a little bit about the right side uh, preparation. Andreas, it's up to you. Thanks. Welcome and thank you for the introduction. Um, I will just give a short introduction on the indications, the patient selections on right hemicolectomy. And um, it will just start for the further lectures who will show you the videos and the planes and how to do it. I will be on the, today I will be more on the theoretical part. So, um, I think we all can confess and uh, state that elective colorectal resection should be routinely performed laparoscopically in these years, in 2020, and uh, we, we cannot harm the patient, and we have all the benefits due to the minimal invasive surgery. And uh, we have different indications for the right side. Of course, we have benign disease, the chronic inflammatory disease, ischemia, stenosis. Also, we might have diverticular disease, almost singular perforated diverticular disease, complicated appendicitis, and what we more talk about is the carcinoma. And um, what we have to be and have to bear in mind that the right-sided hemicolectomy in 2020 way it's now a real plain adapted anatomical straightforward um, oncological resection with a, a highly impact uh, lymphadenectomy it, it started almost um, 15 years ago 12 years ago it was uh, Hohenberger from Erlangen in Germany who invented um, the, the complete mesocolic excision. He transferred the concept of TME from the recum to the colon. And uh, since seven years, is, uh, it, is, it is established, this technique, in the guidelines for laparoscopic and for open colorectal so colon surgery on carcinoma. And uh, the thing is, which is which we should take care is like in the rectum the complete integrity of the mesocolic fascia on both sides and of course and and really really high tie meaning a central a very central ligation of the artery vein and and this makes it even more difficult as years ago and sometimes an extended lymphadenectomy so when we have a patient with a carcinoma on the 
let's say, right side ascending the circum, the right flexure. We have two options for the operation. We can do it open and we can do it laparoscopically and almost from a survive, which we did in Austria, we know then the percentage of laparoscopic colorectal procedure elective is something between 35 and 40 percent in Austria, but the open, uh, but the right sided are more open than the left sided. So many clinics do the open procedure, they're the right sided procedure in open way. And then you can do it the conventional way, as you learned it, just go straight through the meso, just take the iliocolic vessel somewhere, or you can try to be oncological on top of the tops and do the CME. So, and therefore, we have to state that this procedure is now not an operation for beginners. When I was at the residence at the start of my career, the right hemicolectomy in an open procedure was the first big procedure every young surgeon learned. Now, the right hemicolectomy on the laparoscopic way is not the operation for beginners. It is an advanced procedure. And uh, we have to think about if we have a patient on the one side and the surgeon on the other side, if this procedure now is the right procedure for the right surgeon. So if you're responsible for the patient, it's not an operation for everyone. But we will show you how to do it. Even Walter and Colin will, will just teach you and show you today what to do. What about the quality of surgery in malignant disease? This is just general knowledge. We are just checked by the number of lymph nodes, by the quality of the mesocolic fascia, the CME, and in rectal cancer, the TME. Then we have, of course, the R classification, the resection margins. In the longitudinal and in the circumferential way, um, if there's a perforation of the tumor, perforation of the, of the meso, and of course, if it's on block, the resection. So we know since um, many years that at least 12 nodes you have to bring that you have an oncological uh, procedure. On the right side, usually if you do a complete CME with a lymphadenectomy, there are almost usually 25 to 35 lymph nodes. Hohenberger showed in his paper and, uh, four periods um, with, with more than 1,300 patients that um, this procedure, which we are going to show you today, gives an improvement in the five-year survival and an improvement on the tumor recurrence. Um, years has a mortality on 3%. And even the leakage rate, which we'll talk about it, is on the right colon almost higher than on the left colon going, which I will show later, up to 12%. So you can see here the superior mesenteric vein. And this is the crucial point. You go up, um, here's the pancreas, and you go just really to the origin of the superior um, mesenteric vein and artery. And uh, like on the, on the left side, where you start um, at the ligament of triads, you have to free all this surrounding area from the lymph nodes. Let me show you just on a short video. This is the vein. And all the surgeons say there are no nodes on the vein. They're all on the artery. I show you just um, the, the, the ways to do it, which we never did in the open way, just to take care of the vein, follow the vein, and just check every lymph node and all the lymphatic tissue surrounding the vein, of course, also the artery. And this makes this procedure to a really wonderful procedure if you feel comfortable and demanding procedure, but a procedure which gives a benefit to, to the patient in the five-year survival. Okay. So Hohenberger and his team, he did a comparison with the clinic of Leeds. They compared the new technique, the CME, with the standard technique. And um, um, it's only, it's published um, eight years ago, and it's only a small patient group. They did a prospective 49 patients with a photo documentation and a, um, a CME and a lymphadenectomy over two years. And they compared it with Leeds, where there were 25 prospectively and 15 retrospectively patients. And what they 
did, they, they made a complete measurement of the length and of the, of the, uh, of the meso and of the vascular root and um, they just calculated the quality of the specimen on measuring it. And they found that the lymph nodes in the Erlangen group was much more significantly higher than uh, on, the, on, the, on the Leeds node. There's just one critical point, maybe, that uh, in the Leeds group, 10 surgeons performed 50 procedures. So this might have an impact. But as you can see, the quality of the mesocolic plane is uh, almost 85% best quality. Um, and only in a few percent, they, they missed the plane and made, made a, the damage to the intramesocolic plane. And on that uh, tables, you can see just the measurements that in all the measurements and the distance and on the lengths, um, the Erlangen group with the CME had better quality specimen, significantly better quality of the specimen and more lymph nodes. And they came to the solution, to the conclusion that the CME and central vein ligation and the lymphadenectomy, um, when the surgeon respects the mesocolic plane, uh, gives uh, greater lymph node yield and uh, a better five-year survival rate um, than in the conventional group. Um, short bias, if you read the paper critically, there are no long-term survival data presented. So we know the actual quality, but um, from this paper, we cannot read out if there's a long-time survival benefit. Um, then there is an interesting discussion on the lymph nodes along the gastroepiploic uh, Atera gastroepiploica along the greater curvature of the um, of the stomach and on the superior side of the pancreas and on the infrapancreatic side, um, uh, and um, um, they analyzed patients with the carcinoma on the transverse colon and on the right flexion. There will be a separate session on the transverse colon because this needs to be discussed separately, but. Um, the question is always on the right flexure, how far should we go with the lymphadenectomy? And um, what they could show that they had um, at the gastroepiploic arcade, they had 12.5% lymph point metathesis in 45 patients. And in the infrapancreatic side, they had 20% um, lymph node, patients with lymph node metathesis in nodal positive patients. So um, there are is also out of this paper recommendation that if there's a carcinoma on the right flexion, you should also take the root of the gastroepiploic case and on the transfers, of course, the infrapancreatic lymph nodes, which due to the extended resection leads you to a higher morbidity. And uh, um, just, I think Walter will show you the planes, so I won't show this. Um, the rationale behind the complete mesocolic excision. This is the last paper now from, from Hohenberger um, uh, uh, and, and the group around the, um, the surgeons um, is that um, it rests just um, that we have two fascias. We have to take care. One is ventral, one is dorsal. They see it as an envelope which you shouldn't disturb. And going back uh, to the paper which I started first, um, the four groups, um, you can see, uh, and this is the inter interesting, the, 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 the very blue, the, the, high, the white blue um, line um, shows you in stage three cancer, um, uh, the lowest local regional uh, lymph node uh, recurrence rate. And if you look at the overall survival in the four groups, in the four periods, in the last period, the, the overall survival is um, uh, much better than in the first years. There's another, the cancer rate, the survival is the same, 90% in the last group uh, and 78% in the group from 78 to um, 84. Um, but um, the authors conclude that the CME has a very great impact on the local regional recurrence and um, it, um, the, the tumor recurrence almost never have been an anastomotic or lymph node recurrence, but it was always in the drainage of the lymphatic vessels. I made a note here, a bias, because in the 70s we had different histology. We had not the options from histology as we have now. And of course, 
the adjuvant and neoadjuvant treatment options has not been the same as today. Um, so this might be a small bias. At the CME, of course, is not only the procedure in this really nice to perform laparoscopically with the same quality. And which route should we take now, colon? We have to take the right branch of the mid artery, but not the left one. Um, usually, and of course, we have the iliocolic vessels. If it's on the flagship here, and the lymph node on the gastroenteroloic acate. Now, finally, to conclude my introductional lecture is um, there's a new topic on the Wayne first approach. And I was just cut off. Okay, now you're back okay. again. Sorry, sorry. I wanted to show that um, the meat the complete um, mesocolic excision with a vein first approach to check the lymph nodes on the vein with a, a no touch technique on the tumor. There's a, a wonderful link for this complete new concept now, which popped up last year. And um, um, to do this, just two slides, you need to know your anatomy. We had this on the last two webinars. You have to take care on the vascular anatomies, either by CT scan or a reconstruction, that you know where is the mid colic artery, where the branches uh, from, if, if there's a right colic artery, either colic vessels. So this is mandatory if you want to do a good, um, a good procedure. And um, so to conclude, sorry for getting cut off um, after, for the last slides, the oncological right hemicolectomy is an advanced procedure. Uh, the CME should be standard in case of carcinoma on the right flexure. There should be an extended lymphadenectomy. The lymph lymphatic dissection, of course, is depending on the localization of the tumor, as I showed before, and it makes this procedure more complex. Uh, it's your responsibility as a surgeon that you choose the right patient for the right surgeon. This procedure is not for every surgeon. It's not the beginners. You need the right team. Everybody should know what to do and, of course, the right technique. But that's, where, that's why you are here, that you get an idea of the perfect technique shown by the other, other colleagues like, like Walter and um, Omar and Colin, um, um, which will proceed now. Take care of your patients. You should know your case and, of course, you should know the vessels. Thank you very much. Now we go to Colin Sieges, who is from Amsterdam, and he's also one of the most famous. He's close to Amsterdam, it's in the Netherlands, and he's one of the most famous laparoscopic transandal TME surgeons also. So Colin, he will tell us about uh, the right-sided full procedure, please. Um, let's start by taking you through the different steps of a laparoscopic right hemicolectomy. Um, Andreas already told you the different indications for uh, a procedure, and I will mainly focus on the malignant part of those indications. And I will take you through the different steps, and of course we start with a preoperative planning of the procedure. In, in my practice, it's useful, uh, we usually, or we always, make a CAT scan of the chest and the abdomen. Uh, this is, uh, of course, to exclude metastatic disease, but it's also important to plan your type of the operation. Uh, like Andreas already showed you, I'm going to show you that again. Of course, we also do a colonoscopy to exclude synchronous tumors and to tattoo the tumor, because specifically in smaller tumors, it's impossible to, to locate the tumor, and it really helps you if you have a tattoo uh, to, to know where they are. So um, preparation also means preparation of the patient. I think everybody knows the EROS protocol. Uh, we follow the EROS protocol as well. Um, so we don't have any bowel prep, but we don't follow the standard EROS protocol anymore. We follow the EROS 2.0 protocol, um, which means that we don't only look at the patient during and after the operation, but we also focus on uh, the patient's condition before the operation. This is called 
prehabilitation, difficult word, <laughs> and we look at uh, the, the, how good uh, or well a patient exercises, what the nutritional status of the patient is, whether or not the patient is smoking, uh, physiological coping, and together with that, we do a risk assessment and we plan certain interventions. So we help the patient stop smoking, and whether there is a nutritional deficiency, we support them and help them to get uh, nutritional uh, support as well. So I think this is really important and maybe we can add a 12th webinar on this subject, but we discuss that later on with Maite. So um, if you do a laparoscopic uh, right hemicolectomy, like with any other operation, you need an operative plan. And Andreas already talked with you about the D2 versus the D3 resection, uh, but you also have to decide what kind of uh, uh, operation you're going to do, whether you're going to do a, a standard, straightforward laparoscopic right hemicolectomy, or are you going to do a more extensive uh, right hemicolectomy. Of course, you have to decide what your sequence of your dissection is. Are you going to start from medial to lateral and dissect the vessels first, or are you going to do a more traditional approach, like an open surgery, and do the lateral part first? Then you have to decide what kind of stenosis you're going to do, extracorporeal versus intercorporeal, and you have to decide what your extraction site is. So let's just first start with the type of the operation. Like Andreas already showed you these uh, pictures, uh, a little bit different, but the idea is the same. And in CME, uh, what, what's the idea oh, is that in uh, cecum tumor and in the ascending colon, you have to do a lymphadenectomy, which includes the right branch of the middle colic artery. And of course, you have to include the iliocolic artery. Um, for a um, tumor in the flexor or in the transverse colon, you have to include the middle colic artery. So you have to do a more extended resection. You should realize that. The next thing you should decide is what kind of lymphadenectomy you're going to do. Are you just going to remove the N2 lymph nodes? Or like Andreas told you, are you going to do a more central dissection and also remove the N3 lymph nodes? So what does a D3 lymphadenectomy mean? Um, in module eight, we're gonna discuss that more in detail and you already heard it from Andreas. D3 means you're going to do a ligation of the iliogolic vein, the right colic vein, endless trunk and the middle colic vein, all at their origin of the superior mastic vein, which means you have to dissect the superior mastic vein and completely free it. Also, you have to dissect the iliocolic artery and the right colic artery and the middle colic artery at the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. This means that you have to completely free the vascular structures. And this makes it a complex procedure. And you have to realize that before you start, that this can have serious consequences for your patients and you can have serious complications. What you also should realize is that the anatomy is quite, uh, uh, is changing a, a lot. And I, I really enjoyed the pictures of Andreas showing you the vascular reconstruction of the uh, vascular anatomy but this also makes it really difficult. It varies a lot. And here again, there's a big risk for interruptive complications like bleeding or lesions uh, or, or, or serious damage to the superior mysteric vein. And you can really hurt your patients if, you're not know, if you don't know what you're doing. So what's going to be the sequence of your dissection? Medial to lateral, if you're going to do a D3 dissection, most surgeons first go to the vessels and, and dissect the, uh, from medial to lateral. But it's also possible in the more traditional fashion if you dissect lateral first. Personally, when I prepared this uh, presentation, I came across this publication, which I really liked because I like the, the TTME technique, bottom to up, and they also described a right hemicolectomy bottom to up. And this is actually the way I perform the laparoscopic right hemicolectomy. So I do it a little bit different like Andreas and Walter. Um, what I do is I start with the mesentery of the small bowel and I start with creating a plane behind the meso, meso of the ascending colon 
all the way up to the duodenum and all the way up to the mesentery of the transverse colon. In this picture, you see that the white line of thought is dissected. Personally, I don't do that. I leave this intact. So my specimen is always in position, the same position, anatomic position, and I don't get confused by rotating of the specimen. What's really important in when you do a laparoscopic right hemicolectomy is that you don't only free the mesentery of the ascending colon, but that you also free the mesentery of the transverse colon. And that's something what a lot of surgeons forget. They do the first part and dissect the fascia of thought, but they don't free the, the meso of the transverse colon of the pancreas. Um, and you see that beautifully in this drawing and in these pictures on the right, you can also see it. And what you have to do, you have to open up fascia at the head of uh, the duodenum on the pancreas. And if you open this fascia, you come into a plane which is called diffusion fascia of Fredet. Uh, and if you do that, you completely release the, the, the mesentery of the transverse colon of the pancreas and of the duodenum. And that gives you a lot more room and length of the specimen. And you need to do this if you're going to do a D3 dissection, uh, but you also need to do this in uh, a D2 dissection because you, you need the extra length for your anastomosis and for your dissection. So what kind of equipment do we use? And standard use two monitors, so everybody has optimal ergonomics. Uh, you can look straight forward, but the scrub nurse standing on the other side of the table is also looking straight forward. Uh, we use a 30 degree camera, if possible an ICG camera, ligature, a endostapler, and the patient positioning is, I prefer to have a beanbag gel pad to prevent pressure points, and the position of the table is, uh, uh, I really like a, a strong tilt to the left, so the small bow is out of the operative field, and depending on the phase of the, of the operation, I have Trendelenburg slightly, or reverse Trendelenburg. So these are my trocars. I prefer to have three 12 millimeter trocars. Of course, you can change one for a five millimeter trocar. And sometimes if it's a difficult procedure, you can add an extra five trocar in the right lower abdomen. If you're an experienced surgeon, of course, you can have a single port procedure, uh, but this shouldn't change uh, the, 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 the dissection or your plan of the operation. Extraction point, suprapubic incision is what I preferably use. So let's just go to the video now. Um, it's a quite long video. So what we begin with is getting your operative field cleaned of, of small bowel. So we tilt the patient to the left and then we lift up the mesentery of the small bowel. And this is actually the line which Walter described last week uh, or last time. Uh, it's a line over the iliac vessels uh, crossing to, over to the left upper uh, abdomen. So you open the, the, the peritoneum over the iliac vessel and then you develop the plane behind the mesentery of the ascending colon. I normally don't look for the ureter if the retroperitoneum is closed, I leave it closed. And the whole idea is, is that you push up the mesentery of the ascending colon, and then by blunt dissection, make a tunnel as far up as possible. Sometimes there are little adhesions you have to cut, but most of the dissection can be done bluntly. And then you follow it all the way up to the mesentery of the transverse colon and to the duodenum. The next step, which I do, and this is different, I think, as Walter and Andreas do it, I make a small opening in the mesentery of the small bowel, and I dissect the small bowel uh, at the beginning, and then I lift up the mesentery, and I clearly see the vessels, and I dissect this, these vessels all the way up to a duodenum, and by lifting it up, you clearly see the vessels, and then at the head of the duodenum, I start looking for the vessels and I dissect the vessels. I specifically show you this procedure. This is not a D3 dissection. This is a D2 dissection. This is what we standard do in the Netherlands. And I'm aware that 
in German-speaking countries, a D3 is more uh, performed, but in the Netherlands, a D2 is the standard. So you clip the ethercolic artery and vein, and then you open up this fascia. This is the fascia of Fredette, which I showed you the picture of. And I think, again, this is an essential step. You open up, it's not a big fascia, it's more like a peritoneal structure, and you free it, and then you get behind the transverse uh, mesocolon and in front of the pancreas, and you get much more room. The next step is that we free the momentum of the ascending colon. And in this case, the tumor was in the ascending colon, which we saw on the CAT scan. And you can see that the tattoo is everywhere in the abdomen. Everything is blue, which sometimes happens, unfortunately. So we put the momentum, we flip it over the transverse colon, and then you see that we can cut the mesentery of the transverse colon In this case, we look for the middle, the, the right, uh, sorry, the right branch of the middle colic artery. And again, I know the dissection is done more centrally by Andreas and by Walter. So you see an evident lymph node metastasis here. So follow it up. and free the last adhesions. So these are the last strands of the mesentery. This is the middle colic artery, or the, the right branch of it. And then if you've done enough dissection from below, so if you've done the complete tunnel to the mesentery of the transverse colon, you only have a couple of adhesions left on the other side of the transverse colon. This is the last trans of the omentum. Here you see the duodenum from the other side. You cut the last peritoneal attachments. This is the white line of thought, the last adhesions which I leave till the last. So then the specimen is freed completely. We put it in a large endo catch and we leave it in the abdomen. And then we look at with IgG whether it's a good vascularization. In this case, uh, there is, of course. And then we make stable anastomosis. Andre is going to show you different anastomotic techniques as well. In this case, the small bowel was slipping away constantly, so I decided to do first a suturing with the V lock. So the small bowel and the transverse colon remained in place. And then we make a stable intercorporeal anastomosis. Make sure that the length of the colon is large enough. You can see that I made a little mistake here, that it's a little bit too short. Preferably, you have a little bit more room. And then the last stitches, the defect is closed with a feel up. So again, this is a little bit different procedure than Andreas and uh, Walter do it. They prefer a D3 dissection. In the Netherlands, we do a D2 dissection. So what's the evidence for a D2 first D3? Just briefly, because Andreas already showed you, you should remember that there's a lot of expert opinions uh, written down with beautiful drawings, uh, really experienced surgeons showing you how to do a D3 dissection. But you should also remember that there is no randomized, randomized data. So a D3 dissection, uh, gives you a more lymph nodes, but it also creates more risk. And it's the question of whether or not these um, risks outweigh 
the oncologic benefit of a D3 dissection. Um, other questions I asked you in the beginning, what kind of extraction site you prefer to use? Um, there are more and more data showing that a midline incision is, uh, is really not good. And uh, preferably we do a transverse or funnel steel incision. The reason for this is that the midline incision gives much more incisional hernias uh, and the funnel steel incision is superior in this case. Um, Extra, uh, the, the intercorporeal versus extracorporeal anastomosis. Um, this is a review done by one of my residents together with a colleague of mine, Jurian Tynan. And we looked at all the literature and it was clear that most of the points we looked at, like length of stay, short term morbidity, um, surgical site infection, most all in favor of an intercorporeal anastomosis. And that all has to do that if you do an extracorporeal anastomosis, you really have to pull on the mesentery. And I think this results in a lot of complications. The last review is done by Steve Wexner, and uh, he reviewed the same literature as we did. So he apparently came to the same conclusions that intercorporeal anastomosis uh, is superior than extracorporeal anastomosis. So thank you very much. Welcome back. Um, just Colin showed already some videos. Um, the goal of all of us is to make a safe anastomosis and to reduce the leakage. And um, therefore we need the best blood supply. I think it's almost standard now to use the um, ICG, um, no tension and a good lumen. So on the right side, usually you have no tension. On the right side, usually you should have best blood supply. And uh, the good lumen that is not too small is just depending on the surgeon's skills and technique. We have different options. We have the option of um, a complete laparoscopic intracorporal, as you have seen, this couldn't be stapled, can be hand sewn. You have the possibility of a laparoscopic assisted and extracorporal anastomosis, where you do through the extraction site, almost at the umbilical area, a stapled or a hand sewn anastomosis. And there are different types an end end anastomosis, a side to side, which can be isoperistaltic or unisoperistaltic, and there can also be a side to end or an end to side anastomosis. Um, so, in the laparoscopic way now, the intercorporal stapled, I think, is the most popular one. And of course, for the beginning, easier is corporal stapled or hand soon one. This one is now a video of um, hemicolectomy where you just, um, you also have to stable the, the large bowel and you just all bowel and you do a, a hand soon um, and you come to Davos, there's the Europe biggest course for laparoscopy and open anastomotic techniques. Next course is uh, at the end of September. You will learn how to do it with one or two sutures only, a posterior wall with a running suture and then the anterior wall with a running suture, sorry for the head inside. And um, this is an anastomosis, which is my preferred anastomosis if we have to do the extracorporeal way, also for teaching just two sutures and uh, a running, a running uh, move a little bit forward, just running the, that you close it and will show you a very good lumen. As you can see here, nice suture line, long anastomosis, good human. So this is an isoperistaltic extracorporeal hand soon anastomosis. Um, the next uh, technique could be an extracorporeal stapled anastomosis where you put just with two stay sutures as Colin showed in the laparoscopic video um, small bowel and large bowel side to side and staple anastomosis take care that the meso is not in the staple line um, if with the first cut there should be no good lumen you have to do a second one or you take just a linear cut with 80 or 100 centimeter and then with a second staple then almost need two 60 millimeter staples or 100 millimeter 
you can do also the closuring and then removal of the specimen. And finally, the intercorporal anastomosis is the same like in the open outside one. You staple the, you staple the small bowel, you staple the large bowel, you take stay sutures where you just approximate, where you approximate the, the small bowel and the large bowel um, together. Um, either as here shown in an unisoperistaltic way or in a peristaltic way, uh, isoperistaltic way, um, you bring them together, then you open it, I move a little forward, you open it gently with electrocautery, and then you bring in the stapler. You have to, sh you have to plan when you do a procedure how you will bring in the stapler from which side, because from that side you need a 12 millimeter port um, and it would be not not ideal if you have to place separately a port only to bring it the stapler in a good angle. So then you have the uh, stapled anastomosis and of course you have to know the suture skills as we showed in our first webinar. Suturing is a conditio sine qua non if you want to do advanced procedures like the right hemicolon laparoscopically then you can do this of course in a running suture way um, almost also with a wheelock thread, which makes it a little more easy. And then I think the most important thing is how to check the anastomosis. And all surgeons, I think, they check the anastomosis in a rectal cancer, in a sigmoid cancer. And you can do also, you can check it on the right side. You go in with the flexible endoscopy, either a prepared or a not prepared patient, you go up, we do, as we said, the flexible endoscopy yourself, and this is how it looks like on table, just after doing the anastomosis, a hand soon anastomosis here, you can check it, you can put water inside of the abdominal cavity, and then check if they're coming air bubbles. Uh, usually, I never have seen that the anastomosis get broken to the um, due to the flexible endoscopy and the gas provided inside. Um, Colin showed already some literature on that topic, so I will go um, rather s uh, um, uh, fast on that. Um, one paper of 11 years ago um, uh, 80 patients on a prospective database uh, and from point of leakage, a difference, but as stated, less wound complications and smaller incisions. And um, another paper uh, recently published this year in colorectal disease. It was some kind of snapshot study. Nobody would, nobody would agree or would accept or would think about the leakage rate of almost 13%, but this is the reality, the leakage rate on the right side is 7 to 12 percent. And uh, uh, they came to the conclusion, the divide moses and uh, the laparoscopic performed uh, anastomosis usually uh, had a higher, the stapled one, the stapled one had a higher impact. They had more times relaparotomy and stoma formation than the hands-on anastomosis. So they came to conclude that the hands-on anastomosis also might have leakage, but the clinical impact, it's almost a small fistula, can be done conservatively without reparation. Um, the stapled one, they have more severe complications. And um, another paper published in Surgery Endoscopy a few years ago, three years ago, 1,500 patients out of 12 non-randomized trials, they came to the conclusion that um, just the intracorporal anastomosis is associated with reduced short-term mobility and the decreased length of the stay and faster recovery. Going through literature is that the biggest advantage if you do it intracorporal is that you cannot twist the anastomosis. You cannot twist it. Um, there is there is, um, if you bring it out to a small incision, it just can, the meso can be twisted uh, 30, 360 uh, degrees, um, which might cause post ileus. And the second is, if you, there's no tension on the uh, providing meso, if you bring out the right colon, the transverse colon for anastomosis, there might be a tension and uh, 
damage on the on the just on the vascular arcade of the remaining transverse colon. And the leakage rate, as I said, is high. Um, uh, all to the literature, the intraoperative anastomosis has a less short-term mobility, smaller incision, and uh, shorter hospital stay. And therefore, of course, also of the incision, um, uh, 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 reduced risk of hernia. Thank you. Okay, tips and tricks for people passing from open to laparoscopic. As I saw, there were only 7% doing just open procedures, so maybe I can convince you. Of course, first, if you talk about laparoscopic colorectal surgery, we know there are some principles of laparoscopy. There are principles of colorectal surgery, and there are a lot of guidelines. Nevertheless, there are no level evidence one for many technical aspects. So if I want to give you tips and tricks, there's a lot of things we just figured out, I just figured out, we learned from others, we tried to teach others. And there is a variability in clinical practice between nations and also surgeons. So maybe in your country, you do things different than I do in my country. Nevertheless, there are some guidelines. And that's the first thing I would recommend to read the guidelines because you learn a lot of them. For example, this is one of the guidelines for malignant disease. And they write already, it's the American Society of Clinical Oncology view, but not that one of your local. And if you have local guidelines, maybe it's necessary to look on them. For example, you see here, patients with non-obstructing, obstructing, how should you proceed? Can you do laparoscopic or not? And you see that in the uh, American system, there are general and, and oncological surgeons, but there's also colorectal surgeons. If this is in your country and you're more experienced, maybe you can do the more complex cases also. Another thing is also for the German speaking, you see there's also guidelines. And there's, there was a question, how far should you go if, for example, you have a flexure carcinoma? Should you take the colic artery, the mid colic artery at its origin? Yes, that would be true. And you find that also in the guidelines. So this is not the, the main focus of our talks, of course, and tips and tricks. But one trick is you can read that up in most of the guidelines. And this is also true for benign. This is one of the benign. Could you do laparoscopic? I know it's in German, but this is also in other languages. And you find most of those, are you allowed to do laparoscopic? Should you do it in a perforated diverticulitis? So even that is possible. There's also a classification, for example. And this is one of the guidelines for Crohn's disease, for example, and colitis, which is very recent. And also there are some uh, very good statements for ileocecal, for example, Crohn's disease. Should you do it? Is the surgery preferred? When should you do that? For example, if, if the, 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 the treatment is not possible by dilatation and it's only uh, the, the ileocecal part, maybe you go for resection. And also the surgical approach, should you do it laparoscopic or not? You see that in 2016, it was already laparoscopic preferred for ileocolical uh, resection in Crohn's disease. If it's more complex, uh, then, then it's more questioned. This was in 2016, but in 2018 already, it was when feasible, you should go for laparoscopy in Crohn's disease if possible. And if um, also for the complex cases, if there is a uh, recurrent disease or complex cases when appropriate expertise is available. Why is this important? Because also the lawyers look in these guidelines. So if you go for laparoscopy and you're not sure what to do, and the guideline says, this is only if you have exper exper expertise uh, and you have not expertise for these complex procedures and you do it and run into problem. So lawyers will also pick that up and have a look on the guidelines. So do it before the lawyers do it. There's another one, for example, for ulcerative colitis. Also, should we do a staged? And you see also here laparoscopic approach is possible. And you get some other tips and tricks. For example, how many uh, medication? What about the medication of patients, especially with uh, immune suppressive therapy, have an impact on what we do? And this is written also in the guidelines. You can lift, uh, um, look that up, of course. So I, I put some golden rules for laparoscopy together and then I, I'm, I'm aware that everybody knows that you should know your case and your team. You should also use your trocar size and position and also placement according to the case. So it's, it's a difference if you have an ileus, if you have a revisional surgery, if you have after several previous abdominal surgery, or if you have a blunt uh, elective case. So that's maybe different. Maybe not for your troker, but uh, to choose how to go in, 
you also should choose your instruments you you um, uh, uh, will use and probably you have a standard and that's the best thing to have standards but for example um, Colin showed you one and that's the question was where do you put your trokers that's another option the diamond position which works for all sides of left and right colon which is possible to do everything that's one option and you can put the camera if it's a five meter camera wherever you want if it's a 10 millimeter maybe if you do the right side you have here 10 and here a 10 so you can switch your camera wherever you think it's better during an operation to switch the camera several times is not a good option so maybe you better learn it in one position for example if you always have it here it's easier because you're then in the same focus if, as you are used to but i know people doing it from above the umbilicus to have the camera here and others are just doing it from here so there's not one rule and one only way to go the, the other thing is of course anatomy and i told that last week is not 3d um is, is 3d but it's not on the screen and on the screen mainly it's 2d and and in 3d it's in your patient and you only operate in your patient and not on the screen so don't lose yourself um, in a field of vision which you have to be aware that this depends on the camera position and also your focus on the target is not all you see and i give you one example um, when we, we had some laparoscopy and of course you are focused on this part and you use um, energy and maybe you are not looking on another part which is here down under and if we, we just now we have freed everything so there's only one small band and if we cut it maybe you see that if we use energy energy can come to a very other part which is nearly it is in our field of vision and you see what happens here down under if you don't look at that you don't realize that it burns on some other place as you thought it would be you see there's a lot of smog so maybe you miss that there was another burning in a, in a region we did not choose and you have to go there and and see what happens and maybe you have to do a seizure so be aware something is happening outside your target but sometimes it's outside your vision or field in the end of the operation you should check that the other thing is you should always use both of your hands and that's especially in the advanced laparoscopy many think it's it's clear but it's not that clear that people are only using one hand and having Cushing already said that the physicians they need a special combination of head and heart but the surgeon he needs head heart and hand and if you think you cannot do the same thing with your left hand what you can do with your right thing there is a nice um, work on on ambidextry in surgical training so your dominant hand and your non-dominant hand we know that you can cover at least up to 80 to 90 percent if you do good, good training with your weak hand uh, than with your strong hand if you train it so you should do that and you should be aware that sometimes um, your instruments are coming better from one side than the other and then you should switch uh, the the instruments to the other side but uh, because you, you need the, the, the line inside. You should always use the instruments very gently, not rupturing. You should also use your assistance purposeful. So some assistance is not helping you and he's more in your way. So you should really um, take his instrument and position it perfect for you. You, you have to use gravity, of course. You should always use uh, first an overview and put in your report. So don't forget to, to sign in um, to, to put it in the report what you found as a, uh, a first setting when you looked in the abdominal cavity that's very important also later on maybe for the lawyer uh, to see that you you're really going for safe the operation in the end it should be the same as in open the, the length of incision in your abdominal wall should not harm the patient but should help him so it should be the same as in open surgery what happens inside there is a 30 minutes rule in difficult cases where you say maybe to your anesthesiologist if you see there is a lot of adhesion and you start adhesiolysis or it's a very difficult case and you start your dissection tell him please in 30 minutes tell me and if you see you make you make no no step forwards maybe you take another 30 minutes before you should really consider to convert and not operate for 10 hours while you lose yourself on the screen remember that the strategic conversion is safety but reactive conversion when you harmed already the patient is morbidity so that's very important it's it's not it's not missing the goal if you go for a strategic conversion and in colorectal surgery um, even if we we come down to the to the first publications 
we have to estimate that it's around 15, maybe to 20%. If you, if you are experienced, it will not be zero. And it should not be only uh, reactive if you harm the patient. Last thing, always end with an overview. I showed you a burning which was not in, in, in our target, but even it was in the field. And we had some patients who had maybe a bowel lesion we, we did not find. So in the end, always have an overview if everything looks in the end of the operation also perfect. Then there are some golden rules for the laparoscopic colorectal surgery. Um, and I would really recommend to make a standard procedure every time. And this is also in the teaching protocols. It should always be the same. Indicate it as an open surgery. You start with an overview, put in the report. I told that already. You estimate the probability of laparoscopy to speed it up a little bit. If not possible, just turn uh, to open procedure. And then you have to do proper organ placement. I will show you later on how you do that. And Colin showed that a little bit. You should really use a no touch and no disruption technique. So the space cement should look in the end, the same as in the beginning of the operation. And you should find and stay in your embryological planes. This was shown already. Those two guys, Carl Tolt and Dimitri Cerota, they described it, Colin showed it, where we should stay and find that planes. And if you look for them where you pretty nice find them, you remember our mid-gut and hind-gut picture already. It was divided for the left and the right side, the inferior mesenteric and the superior mesenteric root. Um, where do you find it for the left side? It's these three. And for the right side, um, it's on the other. I will show that later. But your left side strategy will be like this. I showed this last week. And the dissection rules is also no touch technique regarding the tumor, of course. You search the landmarks and your major directions first. You use the peritoneum after opening the peritoneum and gently touching the mesocolon, either at the border of the peritoneum or not touching the colon, only the fatty tissue around the colon. That's possible because then you will not rupture it. This is what you want to do. Um, and you stay in the right planes, of course. So the, the non-disruptor technique, how does it look? Don't touch the tumor, don't touch the colon, and don't touch the mesocolon inside. It should be just not disrupted. You touch the appendices and the border of the peritoneum, that mainly works. You can also grab the artery, which works pretty good, but not the vein. If you touch the vein too much, it will rupture. And if you want to avoid to break into the mesocolon, always use a swab, which makes it much easier to handle. And think of your instruments. I wrote, take the, the right instruments in the beginning. If you have a very uh, sharp instrument, maybe you, you rupture your fatty tissue and your colon, even if you don't want to do that. So don't disrupt the space cement during the operation. I give you the example. This was shown last year, uh, last week. You go in, you don't grab the colon, you just use the fatty tissue beside, and then you go very, very in the perfect line. You just use the pneumoperitoneum that it opens up a little bit. Only make tension on the fatty tissue and not on the colon itself. If you stay in the plane, it works perfect. Don't touch too much, and you see it's only one instrument. And if you have a look on the instrument, this is not a sharp instrument. It should not rupture here. And I don't take it 20 times. I take it once, rather close to the position I want to do the dissection. Okay? Or another example. This is the example of the swab. I put a swab behind. So if I go through, I don't rupture it. And also here, it's only one instrument, very gently lifting up. This is on a tubulary resection because it's not oncological. Nevertheless, I want to have no bleeding here. I want to just grab it once with a very fine instrument. Next one, for the right side, if you find your planes, it was the ileocecal region as uh, it was shown by Colin. Of course, you can direct come from the vein or you can come from lateral. And there was a question, which is the best one to start? Actually, I think for the right side, it's ileocecal to start here because it's, if you start with appendicectomy, you learn that part and you can easily walk up to the duodenum. Of course, you have to avoid ureter and duodenal uh, damage, meaning that you have to anticipate what will be the next plane I want to meet. Um, and this is for the right side, overview, organ placement. You always have to look for other disease, for carcinosis, for example. I always start with the omentum and place it over the liver. I described it last week. If necessary, I do adhesiolysis. The small bowel should be in the left upper quadrant. You should see aorta and trites. Even in fatty patients, this is possible and estimate really if this is laparoscopic possible. If you have the feeling it's not going, so just stop it. The 
right urethra is very important. And in the right side, it always plays a swab um, immediate to, to start the dissection. No touch technique. It's, it's pretty the same as I showed you for the, for the left side, but I used the last ileal vein as a guiding structure to approach the vein. And this is if you go for the, for the CME and the high tie and you really have to follow the vein, this is necessary that you find your line. You see that again, very gently touching. Here is the swab. I lift it up. This is the same line up to try its flexure, which was shown by Colin. You see the instruments are very smooth. We don't want to rupture it. The meso should look at the end of the, of the operation really the same and not ruptured overall. Okay. We go up. You see that also? This is the border of the peritoneum I was talking about. You can, can grab it here, but not inside here. Just grab the border of the peritoneum. This is possible if you want to lift it up. Um, the, otherwise, you will rupture it. And we go up. Here is the vena cava. Here is the aorta. We go up to try its flexure. This was nicely shown. You see the duodenum. As long as you see it, it's perfect. You have to anticipate it's here. You don't want to damage it. The next thing is I put the swab to lift up the meso. So here's the right meso colon. This is duodenum. You see, I don't grab the meso, but I put the swab and I lift up the whole specimen with the swab because I don't want to break into my meso. It's, it's, it's a fatty tissue. You, you easy rupture in. You don't want to do that. You want, just want to separate the embryological planes from one each other. Cava, duodenum, just separate it from one each other. And then the last one, if we, if we go up even higher and then we approach our vessels, be aware that you can grab the border of the peritoneum. You see that here, here's the vein. We are just going up the vein. We are separating. This is ileocolic vein. And we really want to stay very close. You can look it up from below and from above. This is the vein from below. We really want to see it before it, we cut it. This is inferior, uh, superior mesenteric vein. We run along and we want to have all those lymph nodes with are there. There was a question, how can we know that all lymph nodes are there? So if the vein is looking like this and we do that in open, we should also do that in laparoscopy if we want to have those uh, uh, central ligation of the veins. And you can do it by clipping or by stapling, whatever you want. So I jump over that. That's just a short video to show you how it should look in the end. Um, maybe these were the colic veins which you wanted to preserve or you cut it, but this should look in the end of the operation complete, free of all the fatty tissue. So let's go ahead. Uh, there was a question about transverse channel specimen retrieval. This is possible also for the right side. Here we are coming through the vagina. This is the uterus. We put in a troker. We can put in a bag. And if we separate it fully, the specimen from the ileum and from the transverse colon, we can put it in a bag and uh, retrieve it transvaginally, so that's another option. And then we can do the intracorporeal anastomosis. You see, this is quite easy going down, and we suture the vagina again, but we don't need another incision intra-abdominal. Okay, so the specimen should look the same in the end. Maybe it's better to use a bag to not disrupt it. At least, love the vessels. This was shown. You want to avoid complications by anticipating the anatomy and your situation. And remember, strategic conversion is safety and it's not morbidity. We want, don't want to uh, disrupt it. And in the end, the anastomosis and the stoma formation are major crucial steps for the patients. Make a team time out before the anastomosis. Don't rush out and think, well, now I'm finished. It's perfect. I had a very difficult dissection. I only need one minute for the anastomosis. That's not a good idea. We want to have a real nice end of the operation and end always with a last overview, as I told you. This is what I really recommend to do. Um, and I think this is my part. And I now it's a real pleasure to, to hand over to uh, Omar, who will, will do the next uh, and, and tell us something of his, I want to check. Yeah, the, he's already there. Omar, are you hearing us? And it's a real pleasure to have you and present our, our local, your local part. Oh my okay, God. thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really an honor to be with you. Uh, it's already night in Saudi Arabia, so I would say tonight. And uh, I will just uh, present our uh, experience in, in, in Saudi Arabia uh, and, and in the Gulf area where we are in the heart of the Middle East, 
our experience with uh, the colorectal surgery, uh, both the open and laparoscopic. Just to, to let you know here in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, the first laparoscopic surgeon or the first sorry, colorectal surgeon was uh, Professor William I. Smithel, probably uh, some of you will know him. He was the first colorectal uh, surgeon in Saudi Arabia. He started here in 1990 and uh, he left Saudi Arabia in 2000. So he's the godfather of colorectal uh, surgery in Saudi Arabia. Uh, in 1998, we have our first uh, Saudi colorectal uh, surgeon. And in 2005, we were only nine colorectal uh, surgeons. So uh, we started our uh, fellowship in colorectal surgery in 2008, and in 2009, uh, we launched our uh, uh, colorectal uh, society. And now, uh, we uh, launched the society uh, with the Gulf uh, states in Saudi Arabia and the other five states in Saudi Arabia. They have a, a ch uh, each state had a chapter in our society. Today, we have over 50 colorectal uh, surgeons in the, in the region. Uh, so, uh, when we started the colorectal uh, fellowship, this was one of the uh, uh, ways we have increased the number of colorectal surgeons. We started in 2008. Now we have a, a total of uh, 28 actually uh, colorectal uh, fellows that graduated uh, from the program. We started with only two centers in Saudi Arabia. And now we have a total of six centers. Uh, next year, we'll go up to nine centers. This is Dr. Nasser Asana, who was the first president of the uh, society in 2009. And this is the year where we celebrated the uh, colorectal society in Saudi Arabia. We have uh, colorectal surgeons from all over the world. Uh, you can see from the United States, from Canada, from uh, Europe. Uh, uh, so back to the uh, colorectal surgery itself, uh, uh, we uh, are not separate from the world. We have faced the same difficulties that were faced at the beginning of the era of laparoscopy. Uh, we know that the uh, first laparoscopic uh, colon uh, resection was the laparoscopic right uh, hemicolectomy was done in Miami in 1991 by Dr. Jacobs. And uh, uh, they faced a lot of difficulties uh, from the others in accepting the concept of laparoscopy. Uh, at that time, there were lack of oncological uh, data to reassure the uh, safety of the operation. People were asking about the uh, 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 port site metastasis. They were asking about the retrieval of the lymph nodes, even the uh, uh, safety margins. And between 1995, where uh, the article that was published in the disease of colon and rectum by uh, Professor Wexner uh, about the safety of laparoscopic, till we have seen uh, at the beginning of the light in 2002, when Dr. Lises from uh, Spain uh, published his uh, trials. And uh, this was also uh, complemented by the COST trials in 2004, uh, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, where they have shown that the, uh, the uh, oncological results are similar between laparoscopy and open surgery. So here we go. We have the uh, right way or the other way. Uh, here in the region, we have uh, chosen since 2005 uh, the right way and to go with the uh, laparoscopy, laparoscopy. So to just give you a better... So I'm giving here a story about the... Uh, uh, which I think and I hope it was a success story for uh, starting the colorectal surgery in the region and then shifting from the open to uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, surgery. Uh, so to do that, we have studied the population very well in, 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 the, in the region. And as, if you, can, as you can see from uh, this slide, that we are different than the West. Uh, probably in the West, you have uh, 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 the uh, percentage of people above the age of 50 is way higher than the percentage of uh, people uh, in, in, in the region. Uh, about 60 to 70 percent of our population, population are younger than the uh, age of 50. Then we started the uh, cancer registry in Saudi Arabia. We, uh, it was there, but we did a proper one. We have improved it. 
uh, we were very critical about uh, 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 registering every single uh, case in the country. And you can see here, we were surprised that colorectal uh, cancer was the second commonest cancer in the region after breast cancer in the female. And if we look at the most cancers among uh, uh, our nationality by gender, it was the commonest cancer in men. It was more common than prostate, more common than lung cancer. And in the female, it was the uh, third commonest cancer after breast and, and uh, 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 thyroid. If you look more deeper, you will see that in the uh, uh, people above age of 75, it's the uh, second commonest cancer in both gender, and it still is the fairest one in, in, in men, as you can see from uh, this slide. So we have looked then at the results of our colorectal surgery. As I said before, 1998, there were no colorectal surgeons. The, 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 the procedures were done by uh, general surgeons. Uh, uh, and if you look at the statistics, in 1994, the number of cases up to 2015, you will notice that there is an annual increase by 9%. And probably this is due to a better registry. The life expectancy has gone from uh, uh, 69 up to 79 in male and 82 in, a fe in female. Uh, we have a better diagnosis. Uh, we have much more uh, uh, gastroenterologists doing more scopes. And uh, uh, unfortunately, what happened in the area, the shift on the diet, people were uh, from the early 90s starting to shift more towards the fast food. So we got a obesity, which is a, a major disease in the region. We rank second after uh, the uh, American. So... If you look deeper and deeper and look at the uh, stage of cancer in the region, uh, compared with the United States, 24% of the uh, cancer, colon cancer patients in the United States uh, potentially incur incurable as compared to 38%. So we have a, a higher percentage of uh, uh, metastatic disease. So. We, then we looked and we, uh, it was very clear we have a problem with catching those patients early. So we set up our screening program, which has had led to uh, an earlier diagnosis of those patients. If we look at the five-year survival of colorectal uh, cancer patients in Saudis or in the uh, whole Gulf region, uh, when those cases were done by general surgeons and compared to benchmark it to other uh, countries, uh, clearly we had a problem. The uh, five-year survival uh, uh, from all stages were only 44% as compared to 66% uh, in the West. Uh, if you look by, by stage, again, we have a similar problem. So all of that had led us to uh, uh, work on uh, uh, the, uh, uh, so with the Saudi and Korean society to uh, put a, a guidelines, guidelines and standardize the uh, management of colorectal cancer in Saudi Arabia. And uh, this, was, this job was started in 2005, and uh, uh, it was, we published our paper in 2014, where we had the uh, uh, guidelines, the clinical guidelines for managing of colorectal cancer. Now, let's see what happened after uh, this experience. We looked again at our long-term outcome after complete mesocolic excision for colon cancer in, the tertiary, uh, in a tertiary care center in, in Saudi Arabia. And we can see that the five-year uh, five overall survival by uh, all stages was uh, much better. Uh, our uh, five-year disease, uh, five disease-free survival was 69 uh, for sigmoid uh, left colon and the same for the right colon. If you compare it with uh, the previous one in the uh, 90s, uh, we were only 44%. So there were, there were a very uh, noticeable improvement in the management of those patients. We concluded that uh, if we benchmark to the international sites, our uh, uh, outcome was very comparable. 
then we looked at our laparoscopic cases and we compared the survival between the laparoscopic uh, and open curative resection for colon cancer. This paper was just published. And uh, we found that the, uh, uh, the uh, overall median uh, follow-up uh, 46 months, three-year overall survival was 76% for open, and it was much higher for the laparoscopic uh, uh, surgery, uh, so with a significant p-value. And if you look at the uh, operative characteristics, characteristics for those patients, they were very comparable between the open and laparoscopic uh, uh, approach. And if you look at the uh, complication rate, uh, the complication rate uh, were uh, almost similar between the open and laparoscopic ca uh, cases. Uh, 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 if we uh, uh, look at this present study, our present study, and compare it to the international uh, published studies, uh, namely the color and the classic uh, trials. Again, the results were uh, very comparable. If you look at the disease uh, uh, free survival, the overall survival, again, uh, we were uh, uh, in a very good position. And in fact, it was much better uh, position than uh, the 90s. But this uh, uh, did not come uh, uh, easily. As I said, we faced problem first of all with uh, convincing the uh, health authorities that uh, we started with the rectal cancer. There are a lot of data to show that when those, when those patients were done by a specialized colorectal surgeon, the results are much better. And we were able to convince them. So all rectal cancer uh, cases were sent to the tertiary centers where there are uh, a, a lot of colorectal uh, surgeons in those centers. Then we moved to the colon. And the same thing, we used the same strategy, and we showed them that with the colon, we got, uh, uh, again, much better results. So what's happening now, most of the colorectal uh, cases, non-emergency cases, will be repaired to a colorectal uh, surgeon. Uh, then we have faced another difficulty to convince people with the uh, laparoscopy, and we were very suc successful. If you look at the region before 2005, probably uh, very close uh, to zero that the percentage of laparoscopic surgery. We're almost all then open. 2005, we started the program for laparoscopic surgery in the country through uh, 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 outreach program. In 2008, uh, through our fellowship program, we started uh, teaching uh, all the uh, colorectal surgeons, the newcomer colorectal surgeon, uh, the laparoscopic approach. We were very successful before 2005, as I mentioned, close to zero. And now if we look at the major centers, uh, close to 82% of the cases for both colon and rectum are being done uh, via laparoscopy. So uh, to summarize, I think that laparoscopic colon and rectal surgery in the hands of a well-trained surgeon can be performed safely with short hospital stay and acceptable complication rates compared to the open approach. And uh, uh, the evidence from the published randomized clinical trials uh, is emerging that uh, those conditions uh, can be done uh, via laparoscopy and represent the better treatment option for most uh, conditions. Uh, one probably uh, strategy we, we are convincing people right now is to tell them if you would accept that a patient with, uh, who's going to have a gastric bypass will be done by open, then I think we should accept that a, a colon resection should be done uh, open net laparoscopy. And uh, I think I have ended my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much all together. Now we are finished, Omar, that was very nice and interesting also from your point. So there are a lot of questions and um, um, we will try to cover some of them and I will start with Andreas and I will there were some questions on bowel prep plus minus antibiotics especially regarding intracorporeal anastomosis regarding the troker side if you go in with the stapler in and out so what do you do bowel prep and oral antibiotics on the right side well we did for many years fast track without bowel prep and um, due to the latest uh, papers, we started doing 
a complete mechanical bowel preparation, the washout and giving antibiotics uh, in the afternoon before the operation, in the morning, early. And um, the reality is um, if you do no bowel preparation, usually you have no stool coming out during the procedure, but if you have a washout, it's almost the liquid which comes out if you open the bowel. Anyway, we didn't have any complication with abscess formation inside the abdominal cavity performing intra, as a complete laparoscopic intra-abdominal anastomosis. Okay, then there was a question for D3 and CME. Is this a difference? D3 dissection and CME, what do you think? Is this a difference or is it the same? Well, that, that's what usually it's mixed, but we have the resection according to the planes, the complete mesocolic excision is one hand, and the lymphadenectomy and the extended lymphadenectomy is a complete different chapter. But today, people read the papers on CME and think CME is always a D3 lymphadenectomy. This is not true. Okay, perfect. And one last, if, for example, you imagine you have on a, on a pre-operative staging, you have an N0. And if you have N0 on the staging, do you need a D2 or is a D1 enough? Well, we do it according to the localization of the tumor. And um, usually, usually we do accept a, a really very small tumors in very old patients. In, in young patients, we do a D2. Okay, perfect. So Colin, let's move to your, um, to your lecture. There was a question of drain after surgery on the right side. Do you use drains? No, we never use drains. Just for not, 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 elect, not, not standard. Just uh, when it's really bloody, uh, but it's it is uh, mostly. What about not. what about if there was an abscess? You do a, a Crohn's disease with an abscess. Do you put a drain? Uh, not always. Uh, we, um, the drain doesn't prevent uh, a new abscess. Uh, the abscess appears when you remove the drain and you wait. So, so uh, I oh, don't. God, think not that, in standard. No. What about the closure of the mesenteric defect? Do you do uh, that? Same answer, no. Uh, but sometimes, if it's if it rotates and the defect is really large, then 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 I I do one suture, but not standard. Actually, we changed that in in former days. On the on the right side, you 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 always did it um, in in the open. You always did it on the left side. We stopped it. We had a lot of left sided then more than we thought. And on the right side, we we stick to that. Yeah. The question is if there is you think that you can harm the patient with closing the defect? No, I don't think so. It just uh, if if you use just close the peritoneum, you don't st st stitch too deep into the mesentery. Theoretically, of course, you can uh, you can uh, influence the blood flow of the mesentery, but if you do it carefully, I don't think it's a problem. Okay, there was one other question about the number of lymph nodes. Does it matter if we have less than 12 lymph nodes, both of you or Omar also, if we have less than 12 lymph nodes in a cancer case in the specimen? Does it matter? Omar? Well, and uh, here in Saudi, when, when we, in our, uh, actually in our hospital, when we have uh, less than 12 uh, lymph nodes, we uh, stage it as an X. So uh, most uh, of the oncologists will go with chemotherapy. Okay, but you would not go in and resect more? Uh, I, I don't think so, no. Okay, and there's a last thing. Maybe if you have a very bulky tumor, all three of you, is there a place for a neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Don't think about liver meds. It's only a bulky tumor, which is, for example, very close to the duodenum. Would you go for neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Is there a place for it? Yes, we, uh, we, we do that uh, if the tumor is locally advanced, uh, especially for those uh, uh, invading the bladder or very close to the uh, uh, duodenum, we start with neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy. And okay, actually Colin? we are running a study right now. Okay, thanks Omar. Colin? Uh, well, uh, I know there's getting more and more evidence that, that certain su subgroups of patients will benefit from it, but I think that's still in, uh, in research phase. 
Um, of course, if patients have a T4 uh, with, with ingro in, 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 uh, in, in the duodenum or the bladder, you try to, to, to get it smaller with, uh, with, with chemotherapy. But uh, in standard patients, no, no, there's no room. Okay, Andreas, what do you think? Uh, What's your opinion? Uh, same answer. We do not do it routinely. We do it after intensive discussion in really seldom selected cases and young patients. Okay, perfect. I think we have uh, some few minutes. It was it was a real pleasure to have you here. Thanks a lot. I give you again our um, what we had today. And if we go further, you see that we have the next module. Some of the questions like for post-operative complication and its management. And you see also those we, we diagnosed, uh, we, we discussed now the T4 tumors, uh, tumors will come in module eight, or there were questions for the rectum, which it will be in module nine. So please come and look for all those modules. I just give you the chance for the uh, module number four, which will be in September, 10th of September in the evening. And you see, I will be there with Colin and we will have as a guest, uh, Friedrich Herbst from the Vienna, hospital. Uh, he was on the university and also from Krakow, Poland, Michal Pecerevac will, will be with us and this will be very nice. Thanks for having you here. Thanks to all those uh, presenters who did a great job and thanks to Medtronic who organized it. Have a nice evening. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>